you so much for doing this. Um, I feel rather stupid having come across uh, your work on the later part of my exploration of this entire idea spectrum that I've only recently sort of come across. And the reason why I feel stupid is because it is almost as if what you were saying is fundamental to understanding the rest of the picture. I think... By the way, are, are we recording yet? Yes, we are. Because I don't see it on my end. No, no, I, I just record on OBS. Ah, okay. Oh, so it's a separate software that will record the whole thing, right? Good because know, Zoom messes know. the quality up. Ah, um, sorry for no, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. You're fine. You're fine. That's fine. Yeah. Um, it's it's almost like the at least the 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 exposure I've had to your ideas, um, both in text and in, in in audio video. It's almost it's almost as if you are the one manning an, a very important node, and maybe the the, the picture is more personal than it is. Uh, palatable for the masses in that sense because I often think we are not no longer talking about ideologies when we refer to ideologies we are speaking of narratives right it's it's it, the ideological world has become sort of the narrativized world it's two separate distinct narratives not the precursor to narratives which is ideology mm -hmm. and um, history or the telling of history is very important we had this huge debate in the West while I was studying at Columbia about how postmodernist history has sort of, um, you know, reinterpreted what America and Canada stand for. This was the famous debate that Jordan Peterson sort of had, like all of that happening. And it made me realize how important narratives were for the formation of a cultural consciousness, let's just say, right? Sure. And throughout what I was listening to and reading, I kept wondering if what you were talking about should have been a book. And not just like as a fundamental way of delivering a complex set of ideas that are all interlinked. Have you considered though, like writing a book about that? Yes, yeah, sure. So, you know, part of uh, the byproducts of all of these conversations, be it podcasts or uh, the articles I've been writing is to create a coherent set of ideas that can give people the tools they need to recognize false narratives hmm and dismantle them on their own terms. Hmm. You know, the, I can't tell anyone what to think, hmm. and I shouldn't tell anyone what to think. No one should. But you can make people think hmm. and let them come to their own conclusions. And that's a huge failing hmm. of the Indian education system. It doesn't teach people how to think. It teaches people that X scholar, Y textbook is the holy book. Memorize it. This is your gospel spit it out in the exams and your reward you know, every step of the way if you do well in school you do well in university the reward is you get to inch a little bit closer to being part of the elite hmm. it doesn't give you any skills it doesn't give you any critical thinking and it prevents you from realizing the gross distortions around you hmm. so is your argument that we need we need to redo the education system or is it that there are false narratives that exist in society, not just in education that we sort of need to undo? Like where, where is the thrust? Both, both. They're a reflection of each, each other. other. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's not just the education system that needs to be reformed or reconstructed. It's uh, the entire conception of India as a state, hmm. uh, you know, in this post-independence period hmm. uh, where we have to constantly question and reevaluate uh, whether the state institutions that we've created are working in the way that they were intended or you know actually benefiting mm. the the citizens actually reflecting their values and delivering on that or whether it's the other way around and we've created another holy book that the people are unworthy of and we need to constantly try to live up to the expectations of these wise men and this book, uh, the Constitution, and uh, you know, it reminds me of uh, what uh, the East German uh, poet said, uh, Bertolt Brecht, uh, who is in the syllabus in uh, Delhi University, if you study mm -hmm. English literature. Uh, he said that uh, if uh, the institutions have uh, such a problem with uh, the public, maybe they can dissolve the public and elect a new one because mm. it's so difficult for <laughs> the public to uh, get their voice heard. That's so interesting. And so is it not the same? Because here is what I would think when I had not seen the rest of the world. I'd be like, okay, we've got problems. 
for instance the uk or the united states they don't really have all that a lot of problems right i go there and i realize that the sentiment no matter how big or how different the problem might be is pretty much the same they're as irritated as i as i am with say or as frustrated as i am with my institutions as they are with their institutions right sure. how is our situation so unique in comparison to say the rest of the world so our situation is unique because unlike the uk unlike france unlike uh the us or canada or australia or new zealand which are developed uh, countries who either were not colonized or you know are the descendants of colonizers themselves who have mm. wiped out the indigenous uh, populations or marginalized them uh india is a former colony mm. in some ways still a semi colony just like you know latin america just like much of asia much like all of africa except for two countries and that means we're on a very different trajectory that uh when decolonization happened as it was then seen the first wave that the physical removal of the colonizer that was not enough you know it's not enough to just arrange a power transfer between the colonial administrators and hand picked local bourgeois elite who have been trained to think act dress talk walk like the colonizer hmm. and this happened in many countries it happened in india it happened in you know in african countries it happened in the caribbean it happened in latin america that the first generation after independence were just locals who acted like the uh, brown the english elite right yes exactly brown englishman or black englishman uh, as they were called in africa and you know they had studied at oxford they had studied all of this theory but they had very little uh exposure to the kind of challenges that the poorest of the poor felt or the the lack of dignity and self respect that had been engendered by generations and generations of colonial trauma hmm. that people were impoverished they were demoralized they were degraded and a huge challenge for any post colonial country is to uplift them from that state give them back their dignity give them back their self respect give them back some element of economic self reliance and material prosperity that had been robbed of them hmm. and if we look at the indian state today uh since 1947 or even let's say uh from 1950 so 70 years ago when the constitution came into being have we delivered on that hmm and the answer is unfortunately no on many of these parameters we've done extremely badly we have not really taken seriously the challenges of nation building or of giving people dignity or uplifting the poor in the way that other countries did and then you look at uh countries in eastern europe which were devastated after world war 2 they had no money their cities had been destroyed a quarter of the male population died in the war hmm. and then for 40 years they were still you know semi colonial you know they were part of the eastern bloc and uh, you know basically they did what moscow told them that did not prevent them from creating housing for everyone giving everyone water giving everyone electricity mm. giving everyone dignity so why couldn't we mm. do the same so, so rochar i i i'm i'm with you on the frustration right like um it's a very like i don't know how my existence goes down in history books and by mine i don't mean mine personally but like this socio economic bracket this cultural cross section that i'm a part of but it 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 gives me a very unique window into the frustration myself like i see it i'm i i almost cannot wait for everybody to be not dying of starvation for instance or not being malnutritioned or all of that as well like but is it not fair to say that or is this not conventional to hear that we are on the path of that happening why why would i cuz the, the 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 solution you propose is rather a more radical one right now somebody could come tell me prakar listen this is we've been only 70 years into independence chill the hell out man 50 years down the line we'll have what you're looking for right don't try to don't try to run a new experiment that will destroy all of what we've received up and you know cuz the, the the idea that you bring forth that the reason why we are still here is because of this falsely constructed narrative that has not allowed the true transfer of power to the natives where the natives don't represent themselves that it's a colonial representation of a native population 
and that mismatch is sort of keeping people where it's at. So whatever the solution might be from there is rather more radical. Right? Am, yes. I, am I correct in understanding that? So yes, exactly. is it not fair to say that we might be on the path that countries like Croatia, or for that matter, Slovakia, are other smaller countries that they sort of sort themselves out around richness, around wealth. They have Germany on one side and Austria on one side and Russia on one side. Is it not fair to say that we are on the journey? Yes, but on a very slow mm -hmm. version of it, on a very <clears throat> chaotic and bending, uh, bendy road. And if we look beyond uh, Eastern Europe, uh, we can look at China, mm -hmm. we can look at Vietnam, mm -hmm. uh, we can look at even you know countries in, in Latin America. Mm -hmm. They you know also have large populations. They've also had you know huge uh, past traumas of invasion, colonization. Uh, they were very distrustful of uh, you know even globalization for a long time. But they're still delivering better outcomes for their people than we are. Hmm. And, you know, and it's not just these you know, socialist minded ones. You have uh, countries like South Korea or Japan, which were you know, quite avowedly anti-communist during the Cold War and were essentially you know, US client states. Right. But they still had the political willpower to recover from colonization, from the war, from hmm. poverty, from degradation from lack of self-respect and dignity. Hmm. So when these things are absent in India after 70 years, it's not because of any failing in the people, it's because of a failing in the system. Hmm. It's because of a lack of political will. Hmm. If you had political will, you can, <clears throat> you can do this. You know, it's been proven, there's many paths, and at the end of the day, uh, this is where we need to learn from Deng Xiaoping in, uh, in China who you know, came to power in the 80s after you know, the disastrous uh, governance of Mao you know, twice, uh, who tried to jump you know, a peasant society from feudalism to communism you know, with the Great Leap Forward, then with the Cultural Revolution. And he reassessed the system uh, and said that, uh, well, he had two very famous sayings. One was, seek the truth from facts. Hmm. So, you know, learn to think, learn to analyze, find, you know, the truth and, you know, uh, from facts, from, you know, undeniable facts and learn from it. And the second was, it doesn't matter if it's a white cat or a black cat, as long as it catches mice, it's a good cat. And so what that means is, you know, it doesn't matter what the tool is that you're using, who it originally belonged to, what the label around it is. What matters is, does it bring you closer to your goal? If it does, it's a good tool, hmm. and tools belong to whoever wields them. Right. And that's something that's missing in India, that we're married to you know, a 1940s, 1950s conception of the country, hmm. which has become outdated, which hmm. doesn't reflect the aspirations of the, the masses, hmm. and is leading to a lot of social, political, and uh, economic friction. Well... I like I, I agree we can no longer sort of play poverty politics if we want to make a country rich that by itself is the beginning of a contradiction that just is implosive right I, I I'm with you on that but when you say it's not the people it's the system I wonder if it's the circumstance like if it's the fact that we are the range of diversity is at least three-dimensional in India which is quite unlike almost any other part of the world. Probably the closest that we come to is Europe, and Europe's pretty centralized in that sense too, where they sort of kind of have overlaps, they have a long... We have just the strangest kind of linguistic, cultural, blah, 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 blah. You know how they gloss over that with unity and diversity in the official narrative. Um, so could it not be that the political will cannot exist because we are so inherently different from each other? Is that a genuine stumbling block or is that an exploited fissure fissure in the in the system what do you yeah, think? it's it's not a stumbling block at all uh, there are many countries that have diverse geographies diverse populations they have linguistic uh, diversity uh, they have a federal structure and the reason they're divided into conveniently administratable states mm -hmm. is to overcome this challenge Right. You know, it would have been very easy to create a unitary state in India, like in China, uh -huh. where the central government exists, there's no states, and then there's districts. And the central government tells the districts what to do, they implement it. But we didn't. You know, mm. We have a decentralized federal system, 
so does Russia, so does the U uh, US, so does Australia, so does Canada. And you know, in these countries that span vast geographies, that uh, have uh, a lot of uh, diversity, hmm. that's why you know you seek to filter down administrations into smaller units where you can achieve the same sorts of results that uh, you know a country like you said Croatia or Germany uh, or yeah uh, can do in Europe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Or for that matter, Vietnam. Right. So, and, and, and the other part of what you had said was something about political will, right? The fact that political will, political intent, sort of where the human element of the tool bearer comes in, which is what is the intent of what you're doing. And intent's a tricky space, right? Like, it's, it's one thing to attribute intent. It's absolutely another to investigate it. Like, you can barely ever come to what the intent might be. You could yes. probably have a circumstantial case. Uh, but... You know, it's 2014 was the representation of some kind of a change in that sense. We were all hoping kind of, um, as citizens, we were kind of hoping that this man is going to bring that sort of a change, that sort of an intent, that sort of a vision for the next part of India's journey. We had yes. barely escaped economic depression 25 years ago, or almost economic ruin at some point, and, and, and now we were finally standing on our feet. The world was beginning to say, hey, India, you are an entity, and we needed a new sort of a guy. Is like, would you say, wh what is this 1940s approach that is still present in the present political will, or was sort of being tested in the 2014 election? This, this, uh, like you said, the the 1940s version of the narrative that no longer fits the aspiration of our nation now. What is that? Like, what is this residue that we are carrying? So th this is, you know, what uh, some media personalities and uh, self-appointed intellectuals call the idea of India. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, that's, you know, it's essentially a form of nostalgia for, you know, this uh, imagined uh, glorious past of single party rule where a party and leader and family who they claim are socialist and they claim are liberal were in power and were always doing good things for everyone. Mm -hmm. The reality check is they were not socialist, they were not liberal, they were a self-serving elite. And that's you know, been clear for, to anyone who has, uh, has looked at the history of uh, post-independence in India, that you know, if this party, this ideology, this worldview, this narrative had unfettered power for decades and decades to remold the country in whatever shape it wanted. It had a Lok Sabha majority. It had a, a Rajya Sabha a majority. It packed the courts with, you know, its own self-replicating elite. You know, it uh, chose the IAS, IPS, IRS officers. You know, all from that same stratum of society. They had this big vision, this idea of India. Great, they brought it to life. What did they bring to life? Do we have liberal values in India? Do we have freedom of expression? Do we have freedom of media? No, they're severely curtailed, and it's because of that party. Hmm. Do we have socialism in India? Do we have a welfare net? Do we have uh, housing for all? Do we have people getting water, electricity, food? No, there's a lot of disconnect there, and it's only in the last six years that there's been a push to, you know, to bridge that gap. So. If over these decades, you know, you gave them a fair run to create the India of their dreams and they delivered this, of course, it will lead to frustration. Mm -hmm. And of course, in 2014, there was uh, you know, this moment where things snapped and people started to see through the, uh, the narratives that there had been a, a very consistent media narrative. Uh, about uh, certain parties being you know, against the idea of India, or you know they were smeared with oh they're Hindu nationalists this or they're Hindutva that they're right wing authoritarian fascists, and uh, people saw through that and voted for them anyway. Hmm. Now, over these six years, many of those people have been disappointed by the lack of speed or, or intent shown by this new uh, uh, new government. And that is, you know, it comes from two places. One is a misunderstanding of the party. So the BJP 
as a party, although it has been called right wing, although it has been called a Hindu nationalist party, doesn't claim to be itself. And it's not the founding ideology behind it. And it's not, you know, the primary motivation behind the party. Or what they're doing. Like, yeah, or what they're doing. And that's right. reflected in their policy. Right. You know, uh, it's just that the country is so starved of any uh, party that uh, stands for like, equal rights for equal citizens as opposed to special rights for certain communities that, you know, a party that is quite moderate in this becomes the only choice for, you know, pro-Hindu voters. Right. So you can say the BJP is not openly antagonistic to Hindus. Right. But it's also not, you know, seeking to uh, revive, uh, you know, the Former Hindu glory. Mahasabha. Oh, right. Or, uh, yeah, uh, you know, or that vision for the country. Uh, so that's, that's one thing. The other is that it also arose you know, the modern BJP was founded only in 1980, and it arose from the Janta Party experiment. That's why it's called the Bharatiya Janta Party. It was a successor party to the three years that we saw between 1977 and 1980, so after the emergency, when the Janta Party coalition, which was a coalition of anti-Congress uh, parties, so it included uh, the old Congress. So remember, Indira Gandhi in the 60s split the Congress, and her Congress was the new Congress, later called the Congress R, Requisition, and Congress I, Fuindra. Mm -hmm. And the traditional Congress was seen as a bit more to the right, a bit more pro-American, or you know, a bit more suspicious of uh, Soviet aid. Uh, and they teamed up with various socialist parties. There was uh, the Praja Socialist Party, there was George Fernandez's uh, Samyuk Socialist Party, there was the Jansang, which was uh, the uh, predecessor to uh, the BJP in, in many ways, at least in terms of the leadership, that, that's where uh, you had uh, people like Dindyal Upadhyay or uh, uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee. They came together and created what was essentially a center-left coalition to oppose uh, the new Congress of Indira Gandhi, which was seen as authoritarian, autocratic, and conservative. But conservative in a very interesting way. Like, not that there's uh, some sort of defined conservatism that you know applies universally. In this case, conservatism meaning they wanted to keep things the way they were, you know, in this post-independence power transfer that they had arranged. Hmm. And as a result, people opposing them, the Janta Party or uh, Jay Prakash Narayan's Sampurn Kranti Andolan total revolution movement or Morarji Desai's uh, Navnirman uh, Andolan, the renaissance or refoundation movement in Gujarat. These were radical revolutionary attempts to complete the job of decolonization. And you see it in many countries, in many countries in, in, in Africa or in Latin America, after a few generations of the initial power transfer and the initial uh, independence, people got frustrated that they were still living the same lives they did under new management. Hmm. And they wanted a decolonization of institutions, a decolonization of minds. What are a few examples of that? And how did those turn out, those experiments? Uh, so uh, Sri Lanka is one. Hmm. Sri Lanka wrote a new constitution in 1978, hmm. where they ditched the uh, British uh, system of uh, parliamentary democracy, and now they have a semi-presidential one. Mm -hmm. uh, they also created a unitary state, so no federalism, uh, and uh, made a couple of interesting changes. So they uh, made uh, Sinhala and uh, Tamil the official languages. English was demoted to a link language. And then there's Article 9, uh, which says the state shall promote uh, bu uh, Buddha dhar Dharm, so the Buddhist faith, and Buddhist Shashan, so uh, Buddhist administration wherever possible, while also guaranteeing other uh, religions you know, equal rights as part of Article 14. Now, mm -hmm. that's an example of uh, you know, people within a generation of initial independence. Uh, you know, they even renamed the country from Ceylon to Sri Lanka, taking command of their destiny. And since then, the constitution has been amended a few times, uh, uh, as you know, any living document should. 
but ours has in India has been amended over a hundred times, hmm. which shows that uh, you know, it is increasingly unsuited and requires constant maintenance. And there was, you know, an attempt during the Janta Party uh, experiment uh, during 1990, uh, 1977 to 1980, where they tried to undo the constitutional amendments that had been pushed through by Indira Gandhi during the emergency, like socialist and secular in the uh, preamble. They uh -huh. tried to blacklist. So, oh, the... hold up, hold up. I'm so sorry. Yeah. You're telling me secular and socialist were not part of the preamble up until the 70s? No, uh, until emergency in, in 1975, when the opposition huh. was all arrested. So uh, uh, and parliament, you know, was essentially Congress in both houses and the democracy was suspended. They were pushed through in dubious legal circumstances. What an interesting fact, huh? <laughs> and huh. and no party has been able to undo this. Even though, you know, the Janta Party came to power promising they would undo the illegal acts, illegal amendments done during emergency. The institutions are designed in such a way that they couldn't because there has never been a non-Congress majority in the Rajya Sabha. Mm. So the institutions are designed to be conservative and keep us, you know, in, that loop. in the default operating system, as Rahul Gandhi calls it. So he says that the Congress is the default operating system. So, you know, now, if you have a really shitty operating system, if you're stuck on Windows 95, oh my God. then the solution isn't to patch it. The solution is to Revamp you know, the wipe your disk. Yeah. yeah, you know, format the hard drive and install something. Maybe new. buy a new computer altogether. Like, within, <laughs> exactly. within the scope of that analogy, I think that's what you need to do. But... Um, yes. I see. It's so, you know, what was also very interesting to me when we were talking on the phone, I was quite surprised by it. And I, I know this is not what you were trying to say, and I might butcher sort of what we were talking about. But the impression that that rubbed off of me to some extent was that it is not just that the institutions were designed that way, but it is that education and from before education, narratives were designed that way, that they were kept in a specific way for a trade off between harmony and truth where you know we'll we'll discard truth to earn extra harmony um and it's sort of like i've had the marginal utility full of that exchange like give me the truth no more of that harmony bullshit you know um but and this is sort of what those false narratives are also that i've, I've heard you talk about and write about is that they've been repeated over and over as if the subaltern and the native is this distressed uh, confused um, individual that needs to be rescued by this colonial, this Tarzan representation of a white woman saving the, you know, like that kind of a thing. Is that is I, I may have I may have butchered that, but is that is that accurate? No, oh, absolutely. I think, uh, and it's clear with the, if you look at the archives as well hmm. that uh, upon independence there was a huge uh, trauma added to colonial trauma, and that was the trauma of partition. You know, right. And not just partition, the events leading up to partition, the, you know, there was the Mopla rebellion, there was direct action day, there was the Noakali uh, riots in uh, East Bengal, and then there was the partition, which, you know, led to a massive uh, upheaval, led to mass migrations, it led to mass killings, uh, to sexual violence. And, you know, this was something that uh, needed, you know, this was a wound that needed to be healed. There needed to be truth, there needed to be reconciliation, but the post-independent state took a very different view because they didn't have to experience that. They were, you know, an insulated elite who, you know, watched these things happen. And they saw, you know, the best solution as, oh, you know, we should never speak about this again. We should bury this trauma. And, you know, we've seen that it's very easy to deploy violence against the state. We don't have the capacity to prevent another direct action day. We don't have the capacity to prevent another partition either. So what we have to do is create harmony. Hmm. That's our preventative strategy. Hmm. That's the that, second best uh, we can go for in that sense. Yes, right? that uh, you know, now you know, there's uh, you know, a community whose leadership has shown that they can successfully challenge the authority of the state through you know, massive disproportionate violence, what do we do with them? We bribe them. 
bribe them, win over their loyalty, you know, bend over backwards, make sure that, you know, nobody steps on that landmine because we can't guarantee, you know, what will happen if someone does that. That was one approach. And the other, and this is borne out if you go into the archives and look at the uh, correspondence uh, going through the Ministry of uh, Education and the Prime Minister's office or the Zakir Hussain Commission in the 40s and 50s. And then uh, in the 60s, when uh, Nurul Hassan became the uh, education minister, that uh, there was a directive saying that it's very important to create an, an atmosphere of harmony within the country by you know, not highlighting atrocities done by the Sultanates or by the Mughal Empire uh, towards uh, native religions, towards uh, the common people, and rather feed them the narrative that, oh, you know, everyone lived in great peace and harmony until the British came, and then they used divide and conquer to separate uh, us. And look, you know, now because we lost that secularism, because we lost that inclusiveness, partition was our punishment. Mm. So, you know, we have to do <clears throat> penance now. We have to be more uh, huh. sensitive. We have to be more accommodating. So, you know, they first caused partition through their own cowardice by not standing up to Jinnah, by not standing up to the British, and then trans uh, transferred and projected this cowardice onto the people saying, oh, you deserve this because, you know, you didn't, uh, you, you weren't secular enough, you weren't accommodating enough, if only you had done that. So, you know, now, uh, instead of seeing that British India was partitioned into two, it was partitioned into a Muslim homeland and into a Hindu, Buddhist, Jain, Sikh homeland, they saw it as, oh, secular India had two parts of it separated to make Pakistan, but we are obliged to you know, continue on that path, hmm. which was a very bizarre choice. And when you also look at the, uh, the archives and the anecdotes of uh, the partition negotiations, you see some very interesting uh, patterns. So when Jinnah met the Crips Commission, uh, when he met Mountbatten, he wasn't under any delusions like this. He said, you know, that's complete nonsense. Uh, the two communities have always lived separately uh, throughout history. They had separate villages, separate neighborhoods, separate customs, se separate everything. Uh, right. everything. And uh, the foundational principle of Pakistan is the two nation theory. By accepting partition, we have validated the two nation theory. So, you know, by default, even if you know, they haven't officially made it so, India was Hindu Rashtra. Hmm. It was the Hindu homeland hmm. and was created as such. That's something that you know, was very inconvenient and was buried by, uh, by the Congress administration. And it's also something that you know, if you look at what the RSS says today, you know, they're not even very ambitious about this. They don't have big plans to turn India into a uh, Hindu Rashtra. They say India already is a Hindu Rashtra. Uh, right. So, you know, they're like, oh, maybe we'll just make it official. Uh, so, and during the same negotiations, the Congress was represented by uh, Molana Azad, who, uh, you know, gave forth that, oh, yes, you know, uh, we should uh, have uh, a united India, but give lots of power to the states so that, you know, each state can have enough autonomy to keep us together and a common foreign policy, common army, uh, you know, basically the modern Indian federal state. Right. And the third party in the negotiations was the Hindu Mahasabha, mm -hmm. who are smeared today as, oh, you know, these right wing Hindutva fascists who said, they wanted to avoid partition at all costs and were willing in Akhand Bharat, in undivided India, to provide all forms of minority rights to all minorities. Mm. So their vision is also the same as today's secular India. Mm. All they opposed was separate electorates right. where 33... So the other alternative to partition was 33% of the population that was Muslim would get an equal number of seats to 67% of the population that were of Dharmic faiths, which mm. was unacceptable in the negotiations to them. But you know, there was always this, this approach of uh, soft sec secularism. Hmm. Right. You know, again, it's 
and and i told you my intent already so i i don't have to so sort of uh, pussyfoot around around the question um what you have to tell me and only consider my shoes you you have to tell me is um <clears throat> has a lot of intent attribution right the, like this is what so and so wanted at that point they projected so and so and what not and i'm willing to believe that like i have an open mind to that but where do i investigate what do i look at how do i how do i figure it out and how have you figured it out like what is what are the clear signals that this is exactly how it was as opposed to you know the passive approach of what i've always been taught and what will probably be taught for the next two generations like how how, how do i take that great leap forward <laughs> nice use of great leap forward uh so what's important to look at is the motivations and incentive structures behind mm. any decision making right at the end of the day all you know humans are affected by motivation and incentive mm. and when you look at the mentalities behind the uh, new elite that came to power after independence they did see themselves as cut off from the rest of society they mm. saw themselves as this enlightened elite whose responsibility it was and i'm sure it came from you know good intentions right you know, that they weren't malicious and you know in an outright way it's not that they hated the indian public they just uh, felt that oh these poor helpless uh, you know people they're blinded by superstition they're poor because they're you know so religious and backwards and you know i as an enlightened westernized person you know if i could teach them to be more like me if we could make them all you know europeans then one day we'll be treated as equals you know maybe right. we'll be you know yes you know uh, and and this was also a part of uh, of what's called neo colonialism mm. so you know when traditional colonialism ended then it doesn't mean that we stopped being exploited we were mm. just exploited in hidden ways right. and one of those ways is how western ngos and western governments you know come in with uh, uh this tired old spiel mm -hmm. which is oh if only you acted more like us one day you could be rich like us mm. and you know, people in the 50s and 60s really believed that right. they thought oh you know uh europe or you know north america they're rich because they deserved it because you know their culture and society you know was so scientific that it was just so you know open and tolerant and if we just you know copy all of their you know constitutional values and impose them on our country then we can be like them right but that's that's not true mm -hmm. these countries got rich you know by colonialism by protectionism through internecine wars uh through nationalism ethno linguistic nationalism and uh, that's you know to to look at them after they've gone through all that and say oh they're rich because they're so christian or because they're so enlightened or because they threw away superstition that's just falling for their trap that's mm. what they say to trick you so that you know you continue to buy their expertise to buy their products to listen to them and do what you're told mm. like a good little third world country right you know what is also very interesting about you i was i was reading you a lot and listening to you a lot the language that you use and it might be that when you say i use marxist tools to dismantle marxist narratives is traditionally ex like left wing it's not it's not what people would traditionally identify as a right wing language when you say stuff like neo colonialism being a problem ethnic that is the language of american academia to some degree in my head because like that's where i spotted that language being used like it's it's nowhere else but the the, the position you take is very interesting De using that language and i i wonder how how much of that has got to do with your own i mean it invariably does right i was very bought into the idea of justice it's a very prime of a sci appealing idea when you you know you're when you're 18 you're like yeah i want things to be just right mm -hmm. and you go down that road and and there is disillusionment mm -hmm. to which then you adjust and you correct and and it sort of is that your personal journey sort of feeds your intellectual journey sort of feeds your personal journey and so on and i wonder because you'd mentioned i think on kushal's that or or the talk that you'd been students of some of the elite like you 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 you've been you studied under romila thapad i think at du is is, is that a correct No, no. Uh, mm -hmm. Romila Thapar is a JNU and JNU. she's an emeritus. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I studied at JNU. Right. 
And oh, sorry, sorry. I studied at, at DU. DU. So, sorry, my where, where, where is it yeah. that you went to school? At DU? What college? Uh, Hansraj College. Hansraj. Interesting. Yeah, so North Campus. And you studied history? Yes. So, so BA History Honors. Uh, and uh, the entire syllabus was designed by, you know, our eminent historians, by Romla Thapar, by uh, D.N. Jha, R.S. Sharma, Irfan Habib. It was full of their readings. And it was designed from a you know, purist Marxist perspective, you know, uh, in your first year, you studied uh, modes of productions and social formations, which mm. was about the uh, the shifts for, uh, in history from, you know, the slavery mode of production to the feudal mode of production to the capitalist mode of production to uh, the communist uh, mode of production and, you know, how uh, you have a material foundation for all history, and that history is not the story of uh, individual kings and uh, and queens or you know revolutionaries, but rather about larger historical processes which are socioeconomic in in nature. That mm. there's a material foundation behind everything, how people create value, how people sustain themselves, and up on top of that, everything else is a superstructure built on that foundation. So right. what we consider law, religion, culture. These are all reflections of the incentive structure created by you know, how you actually make a living, whether you're living under slavery, whether you're living under feudalism, whether you're living under capitalism. What do you think about that idea now? Because smart I think ideas. it's, I think it's fantastic. I, I think it's a you know, very useful set of tools hmm. to, uh, to analyze history. Hmm. And you know, the, the thing is, labels aren't really useful when it comes to tools. You know, Marxism as a pure, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Marxism as a pure uh, set of tools, you know, without Leninism, without Maoism, without the revolutionary aspects that came later. If you just look at Marx, it's about giving a set of tools to understand history, society, and the economy. And those tools don't belong exclusively to people who call themselves Marxists, and they definitely don't belong to the parties that claim to be Marxists. Hmm. Tools belong to whoever wields them. Right. Weapons belong to whoever wields them. Hmm. If you can use tools effectively, if you can use languages effectively to achieve your goals, to make your point, then it's like what Deng Xiaoping said, right. white cat, black, black cat, cat. it's thing. catching mice, it's a good cat. Hmm. So. You know, we shouldn't limit ourselves by, you know, the labels around uh, certain tools or philosophies, but embrace what brings you closer to your goal and discard what puts obstacles in it. You so, know, yeah. the, the problem with that, you're, you're absolutely right. And I think it takes more maturity than a 24 year old is expected to have to realize that. But what comes packaged with these tools, at least initially, is also a worldview. It's not just ideas. It's not just the skeleton or the architecture or the framework of ideas. It's also the ends of those ideas. And so you consume them wholesome. And maybe later when you consume something else, you have to decide what you want to keep in your stomach still. I'm sorry, the analogy is going way off, but like it's sort of kind of like that, right? Um, yes, yes. And so, it, you, you, I may be wrong, but you also refer to the fact that you were bought into this worldview. Apart from just the tools, you were bought into the yes. worldview of Marxism as well. Yes, right. Sure. Uh, you know, the, the entire Indian uh, education system, especially right. if you study humanities, is designed, you know, to mold you in in certain phases. Mm -hmm. So you go to school. School teachers, school textbooks, tell you that oh everything you learned from your parents and your grandparents about history you know that that's rubbish you know this is the official history according mm -hmm. to the ncrt akbar was this great king you know so secular you know oh he you know cared so much and uh, oh khilji you know was famous for his tax reform you know not for storming uh, the south what slavery no slavery you know everything was right. you know great and the british came and you know uh, used divide and rule on us then you go to university, hmm. study history or sociology or English literature uh, or political science. And then they tell you, oh, no, no, everything you learned in school was also rubbish. You know, the real history was written by, you know, these uh, doyens of academia. 
and uh, you know it says that uh, you know uh, and they they do take edgy positions which are very attractive to you know someone Youngsters. coming into university and then you tell them you know you break them down that oh you know everything you learned in school was a lie in fact gandhi was you know not the hero of independence mm. you know he was a bourgeois uh, you know uh, traitor who you know betrayed the the common people uh, and that uh, you know you had uh, Uh, various uh, schools of historiography so they tell you that oh when you look at indian history it comes in various phases initially there were the british historians who took an orientalist perspective they were like oh look at these wacky easterners you know they're so they live under tyranny you know their past is all darkness uh, and uh, you know the, looking at them like uh, you know animals in a zoo and some of them were well intentioned some of them were writing this for the east india company some of them were writing it for the church basically they were you know writing to understand better the uh, uh, the subcontinent and how better to build upon the existing uh, tools of administration and governance so that they could uh, effectively rule uh, right. uh, their new colony then in the late 1800s you know and the uh, first half of the 20th century this was repelled by the nationalist school of historians hmm. and uh, they're the ones who you know went in and looked at uh, primary sources and said no you know ancient india was not a period of oriental despotism where you know uh, people lived in uh, you know poverty and sadness while this evil tyrant ruled upon them we had very sophisticated uh modes of governance we had the mahajanpads which were noble republics of the time in in ancient times we had uh, empires we had uh, naval achievements merchant uh, achievements we had uh, uh, military achievements and it helped create a sense of identity a sense of self respect that uh, you know we weren't just a country of barbarians who, who were civilized with each coming wave of invaders and colonizers because that's essentially what uh, you know helped uh, the british uh, you know justify their rule that oh you know uh, you're no strangers to being invaded and colonized you know and we're pretty benevolent compared to the others uh, and then so during this phase these nationalist historians you had people like uh, uh, ramesh chandra majumdar you had people like k n nilakanth shastri uh, they, they you know created the foundation for the national movement and nationalism was not seen as a dirty word then as it is in some circles now and in fact it shouldn't be considered a dirty word in any post colonial society right. there's a difference between the nationalism of the colonizer so nationalism in france or germany or in the us you know yes it, it has terrible past connotations because it's associated with you know Uh, expansionism very, yeah an expansionist genocidal tendency a very exclusionary one with war with suffering whereas nationalism in a colony is about forcing the world to recognize your humanity that you know we are equal humans you know to anyone else mm. and we deserve the right to have our own nation hmm. that we're not you know subhumans that we're not second class people who you know are so stupid that they need to be you know looked after hmm. and this was you know still mainstream like even after the first world war the league of nations which was the first attempt at the united nations they had something called the mandate system the mandate system said that there are certain colonies that used to belong to uh, uh to germany or certain territories in the middle east that used to belong to the ottoman empire and they're not ready for their own state they're not you know capable of self governance so very benevolently we're going to put france and the uk in charge of them so you know lebanon was given to france uh iraq was given to uh, the uk uh, -huh. uh they partitioned it you know in a way that you know still causes issues uh very interesting and so you know the nationalism of you know uh, a colony is against that that you know it doesn't matter what you think of us you know we are you know a nation we have a common identity and we deserve to govern ourselves 
on our own terms without your interference without your judgment without your supervision mm. and that applies even today mm. and these countries are still trying to you know sell us this narrative in you know more sophisticated ways with right. their ngos and with their media right. but it still comes down to that right you you also i'm assuming had some sort of a disillusionment with say the conventional or what is taught to me in school what is taught to the likes of me in school because you you said you grew up understanding that in college it was sort of reified and revised in its own way sort of more radicalized if i may but then you had let's just say an inflection point mm-hmm. what was that like well so when you you know leave the toxic environment of uh, uh, the you know indian elite humanities academia or you know it's uh, it's children you know the ias and uh, all and, that yes uh, the De- uh, you know media in delhi mm-hmm. and uh, experience uh, perspectives from outside uh, that circle when you look at how you know other countries after independence developed how they created their own indigenous ideologies their own forms of state craft uh, so in in africa you had so many you know in in ghana you had kwame nkrumah you had uh, in tanzania julius nyerere you had uh, jomo kenyatta in kenya they were talking about uh, uh, african socialism they were talking about uh, ujama there was kenneth kaunda in uh, in uh, zambia so ujama was uh, about uh, village uh, democracy from the bottom up instead mm-hmm. of a top down constitution and then you know you look at uh, your own country and you say you know how come we only have uh, such limited uh, exposure to any of our own post independence indigenous ideologies it's just that oh you know you have uh, these westernized liberals and you have these westernized communists and then you have these uh, you know hindu nationalists but that ignores a lot of the uh, very exciting ideas that came up in the 50s in the 60s in the 70s especially as people got more and more frustrated with post independence india hmm. there's a great uh, film uh, called uh, india at 20 it was made by the films division uh of the government of india you know and tracked people who were born in and around 15th august 1947 20 years later in 1967 and interviewed these young people and uh, it's a fascinating one it's available on youtube i would highly recommend you check it out and there were people saying that oh what is independence meant to me after 20 years what did freedom mean freedom to starve freedom to go naked you know that i see people living you know in poverty i see you know government apathy the you know the rich have enriched themselves they're using the you know same sadistic tools uh, that the british did the same police mm. and you even had you know uh the cpi after uh, upon independence their great uh, slogan was this independence is fake so they had a, a campaign called ye azadi jhooti hai and they argued that gandhi betrayed the nation through partition uh, they betrayed he betrayed the working class nehru was a brown englishman who was creating a fascist police state uh, and uh, that the country was manned by a bureaucracy who were you know englishman and everything except skin color which is sort of kind of what your idea is too right yeah uh, which is in fact what many voters believe even today for uh, sure 70 years later the cpi may have given up on this narrative but all that meant is that this narrative has been inherited by the bjp hmm. and uh, you even see uh, a lot of overlap in and jumping between the two parties that there's many people like millions of people who in the last 10 years have switched from being cpm voters cpi voters left front voters to bjp voters hmm. or at least sympathizers uh, you see it in bengal there's a almost direct vote transfer that hmm. Eight out of ten people who voted for the left front ten years ago voted for the BJP at last year's election. Hmm. Uh, two days ago, uh, there was a, an event in West Bengal, which was the induction of CPM cadre. So you know these 
uh, you know, members of the party who had been trained, you know, in party ideology, who used to go, you know, door to door, house to house, used to enforce party loyalty and rule. They joined the BJP, mm. you know, and this is, it, it's quite an easy shift. You know, you think that that the two opposite ends of the spectrum, but they believe the same things. So the mm. Congress is discredited and both of these parties essentially got their appeal from being radical revolutionary forces that want to end the sick, decayed, uh, dysfunctional system of the Congress that it's trying to conserve. And as soon as the left front got into bed with the Congress, their voters started abandoning them. Right. They didn't vote for the left front because they love Marx or they love Mao or they love Lenin. They voted for them to you know, stick a finger in the eye of the Congress. Right. And if you give up on that in order to save secularism, voters don't care about that. Voters care about you delivering government services to them. They care about seeing themselves reflected in state institutions, hmm. and they will vote for whoever delivers them that. Hmm. Hmm. All right. I have one last question, after which I'm happy to excuse you. This has been very, very dense in that sense. Um, I'd mentioned to you how like my immediate fascination with you even before any of like our conversations had happened any of the recommendations from people had happened any of that had happened even probably before I'd spoken to Kushal was from your Twitter bio and oh, yes and I, I, I don't think I did maybe I did I'm, I'm not sure the other day when we were speaking on the phone um, the reason why that is is I mean you know anybody not anybody might not be the right place to start, but for sure there is a proximate example in your head of an individual. It might be you, it might be somebody else who grows up believing that they're capable, resourced, um, conditioned, responsible enough to do something for the people that are around them, the nation at large and so on. And when they come to do that, they, they especially in a country like India, you realize over and over what a mess the whole thing is. And when you realize what a mess the whole thing is, a very naive attempt is to think I need to do something novel. And, you know, you might come up with those novelties once in a while as well. Oh, this is an idea I have. This is an idea. I'm humble enough to be like, I'm stupid. But I still get those ideas. And very often I've tried to see as to if that idea has been tried before. Right? And I have not, or, or maybe I'm just not literate enough on that front, but the recent idea that I've been playing with, probably a more free market wealth, wealth, wealth focused model of the economy, probably a more free speech and truth model of the society. I've never found somebody stand up for it. It doesn't seem like the BJP is standing up for it. It doesn't seem like the Congress ever stood for it either. It seems like we are be betrayed on sort of both ends. The communists, I don't expect a lot from at all anyway. <laughs> anyway. So I like when I when I read about when I, when I read about Jay Prakash, whom I whom I'd heard from my father several times, he kept me very updated on this version of history. Um, mm -hmm. I think partly because he studied at a school that was run by Ashaka. He was so poor growing up that that is all he could afford. He learned that version of history. He passed it on to me. So privileged me enough to have my eyes open on both ends. It wasn't like I was ever, you know, um, he'd mentioned Jay Prakash to me. And I wonder if that is the man I'm looking for. Was he the kind of man who was leading so some sort of a truth and wealth model over harmony and distribution model of the country? In, in a way, yes, uh, because, uh, you know, what he stood for was, you know, so Sampoon Kranti meaning total revolution, which was a social, cultural, political, moral, spiritual regeneration of the country after 25 years of what was seen as a failed experiment in Nehruvian socialism, Nehruvian secularism, Nehruvian, you know, philosophy. Hmm. And what's, you know, so today, you know, you're very right in saying there's no party that believes in free markets or free speech. You know, all of them will say these are, you know, Western, Western ideas that uh, will not fit in India. In fact, I would say there's only 5,000 people in all of India who understand mm -hmm. what, you know, pure free speech is and what pure free markets are. 4,000 of them won't vote anyway. Mm -hmm. So there's 1,000 who are active about it, you know, wherever possible. 1,000 people won't win you a single seat right. in any constituency. Mm -hmm. So it's a negligible 
uh, vote bank. It's not some, you know, uh, influence group that will have any power on it, unfortunately. Now, when we look at uh, Jayaprakash, oh, before I mention Jayaprakash, you know, you touched on something very interesting uh, about uh, creating, you know, a free market, about creating uh, freedom of speech and you know, privileging truth over you know, convenience. Mm -hmm. uh, so th there are many, uh, n you know, let's say, neo-Marxists, you know, who have reinterpreted uh, or yeah, reclaimed Marxism from, you know, uh, Leninism or Maoism or all of these politicized versions of it and gone back to the essential tools. Mm. And, you know, as I mentioned uh, earlier, they talk about how uh, history is a series of processes, you know, shifting from feudalism to capitalism, from capitalism to, to socialism. Uh, and uh, one of them is uh, Slavoj Žižek mm -hmm. from Slovenia. Yep. So, yeah, he, you know, you would be familiar with him because he debated Jordan Peterson. Oh, I've uh, loved his recently. work for, uh, forever because yeah. I've never understood it. <laughs> <laughs> well, so if I may, I could recommend a great video of his. He, he gave a speech at the Royal Society about uh, 10 or 11 years ago. It's called First as Tragedy, Then as, then as Farce. Farce. Yep. Yes. And in that... You know, he he talks about how the center left or you know soft socialists, social democrats, or uh, liberals, you know who you know, he considers center right. You know, uh, liberals as a center right ideology. What they do is actually more harmful in the long run. That it's best to show people how brutal the system is. You know, if feudalism is brutal and cruel. People need to experience that brutality and cruelty so that they, you know, can break it, so that they can break those bonds. Hmm. If capitalism is unfair, then don't try to make it a little bit more tolerable by putting a human face on it and adding, you know, some vague human rights here and uh, some social justice there. All that does is distract people right. from the misery that they're in. Right. That. Uh, so he says that it's, uh, you know, and then you add some charity here and there, and that just degrades and demoralizes people. He uh, has that great Starbucks example. I don't know if you're familiar exactly. with that. Exactly. <laughs> it's bloody yes. hilarious. And, yeah. and you, exactly. And, you know, you feel good, you feel warm inside, but you leave those people in the same conditions that made them poor in the first place. Right. So, in fact, you know, in a country like India, which is, you know, we're not even capitalist yet. You know, we're still a feudal, semi-feudal society and polity right uh and you know a feudal electoral system as well where we're just voting for our you know cost you know, our, right or yeah. something like that uh, yeah you know, so an mp you know in a mature democracy an mp's job is to represent the views of their constituents in parliament is that what happens in india no no people see oh i'm electing the little raja of my uh constituency and you know if i vote for him then you know, maybe he'll pay attention to me and say, oh, you, you know, you can get, have a road in your village. Right. And if I vote for my caste guy, then, you know, uh, I'll be able to file an FIR at the police station without them beating me up for it. Right. You know, it, people are so desperate that this is what they vote for. That's the incentive. And, and, and this is what the MPs want. MPs want to feel like the kings and queens of their constituencies, even though they don't have any executive power. Yeah. An MP's job is to sit in parliament and vote. Mm -hmm. Nothing more, nothing less. Not to use the MP local, admin, uh, local development funds to reward their uh, supporters. For sure. And not to fix the roads in your village. Mm -hmm. For that, you have the Zilla Parishad, you have you know, the Panchayat, you have various forms of decentralized governance. Uh, so, yeah, we live in feudalism with elections. Now, the best way to end that is not to make it a little bit better and, you know, by adding some feel-good measures, but rather to accelerate the transition to capitalism so that people are given the tools that they can use to lift themselves out of poverty or to demand a state that re reflects their, you know, that's a reflection of their value. Right. So, you know, uh, and this goes back to even what Oscar Wilde said, you know, before socialism was, uh, you know, taken up by, uh, you know, Leninists and revolutionaries in the 20th century, Oscar Wilde, the Irish uh, 
poet and playwright, he wrote a book called The Soul of Man Under Socialism, in which he said, the worst slave owners were the ones who were kind to their slaves. Who were what to the slaves? Who were kind. Oh, kind to their slaves. So the worst slave owners are the ones who were kind to their slaves because it prevented the horror of the system from being you know, realized by those who suffered from it mm. and being theorized by those who contemplated it. Mm. And, you know, that just delays the inevitable mm. that, you know, making an unfair system a little bit more tolerable. Right. Only prolongs. Is, is not, yeah, it prolongs the disease. It doesn't cure the disease. Right. It just makes people suffer longer. Right. And taking decisive action, and that can you know, take various forms. It's like and drinking it's your hangover away. <laughs> right? Yes. It just prolongs it. It's just going to happen the next day, right? That might be a fit analogy. Yes, it gives you temporary relief, but right. long-term agony. Right. right. And, you know, sometimes painful measures are needed hmm. to overcome the disease. For sure. And so then, if we go back to the second part of your question about Japrakash, uh, or, you know, many of these... Uh, Indian uh, intellectuals from the 50s, 60s, 70s. Many of them started off as Marxists. So Jayaprakash Narayan was the son of a, a small uh, uh, government official in the canals department in Bihar. Uh, and uh, unlike you know the other Congress leadership, you know who came from wealth and studied at Oxford and Cambridge, uh, you know with their parents' uh, legal <laughs> fortunes. Right. Uh, he, you know, got us, uh, uh, the opportunity to study at Berkeley in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, paid for it by working as a farmer, by working as a mechanic, by, uh, you know, doing odd jobs here and there, being part of the working class. Mm. And then when Berkeley's uh, fees increased, he couldn't afford even that. He switched, uh, moved to the University of uh, Wisconsin. He was constantly on the move. Hmm. And he was exposed to Marxism in the U.S. Hmm. So not, you know, soft Fabian socialism in the U.K. Right. You know, he, you know, full blown Marxism. Life. Yeah, full blown Marxism. He experienced life as, you know, a proletarian right. in the Western world, in an industrial country and came back. Hmm. And uh, there are others as well. Uh, Sita Ram Goyal, hmm. who's now seen as like the godfather of, uh, of the BJP or of, you know, Hindutva or the new idea of India. Mm -hmm. uh, he was also a Marxist. Uh, you had people like M.N. Roy, uh, S.A. Dange, you know, who founded the Communist Party of India. They were inspired initially by Savarkar. Mm. So there was a lot of overlap, you know, between uh, Indian intellectuals who were trying to create their own uh, ideologies. And so Japrakash Narayan came back to India. He got uh, involved with the Bhudan mo uh, movement of uh, Acharya Vinoba Bhave, so uh, giving land to the landless, you know, as a way of giving people the tools they needed to reclaim dignity, to lift, them, uh, lift themselves up out of poverty. And uh, he began uh, theorizing as well. He moved a, a bit away from Marxism and created, you know, a form of indigenous. Uh, Socialism, you know, based on Gandhian principles, or based on you know, village life, and uh, proposed a new structure for mm. for India. So rather than the state uh, and center relationship, but well, village democracy, and then you know district democracy, then state, then uh, the federal government. And as the frustrations grew among the public, you know, especially in the 70s, you remember that in the 70s. One of the iconic cultural products of the 70s was Amitabh Bachchan's films as the angry young man. Right. The angry young man is also a reflection of society in the 70s. You've seen those films. Mm -hmm. What did it show? It showed frustration. You know, a, yeah, a working class guy where you know everything was against him. The system was against him. You know, the only rich people were smugglers. The police were corrupt. The government right. didn't care because they had their hands in everyone's pockets. And then, you know, he rises up and, you know, gives voice to the masses. That's exactly the kind of uh, sentiment that was tapped into these anti-Congress uh, movements. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what led to the uh, Sampoon Kranti Andolan. So he called for a total revolution He's, uh, and asked for it to be led by the youth, hmm. that young people should go on strike from schools and universities, uh, they should commit themselves to volunteer work, to create you know, parallel structures that actually you know, 
benefited people's lives and communities. Hmm. And uh, of course, the state reacted the only way it knows how by shooting them. Hmm. Uh, and this, uh, you know, is you no know, just proof. It it validated everything that was being said. That you know, how is this different from British colonialism? Right. The, the only difference is that the person who gave the order, instead of being uh, a general Dyer, is an Indira Gandhi, mm -hmm. or you know, uh, her uh, uh, CM of Bihar, Abdul Ghafoor. Hmm. And this created, you know, a lot of uh, panic in the ranks. And around the same time, you had the court verdict, uh, Raj Narayan versus uh, Indira Gandhi, where they found that she had used state uh, machinery to get elected in 1971 which disqualified her from parliament and the prime ministership. And that's when emergency was pro proclaimed. Oh, well, so she claimed you. because of internal and external disturbances that the foreign hand, the CIA is funding Japrakash and funding uh, Murad oh, really? huh. and funding George Fernandez, the trade unionist, uh, and Amnesty International, and Atul Bihari Vajpayee sent them all to jail. Jay Prakash was treated so badly in jail that he never recovered. He, you know, his kidneys failed in jail. He was on dialysis for the rest of his life. He was unable to join the uh, the government once uh, emergency ended in '77. Hmm. You know, he he, you know, offered uh, advice, you know, to Moraji Desai or to uh, George Fernandez and the like, but uh, he was essentially crippled after. Uh, and uh, this, you know, was a period of great hope uh, that the first non-Congress government at the federal level, you know, with this revolutionary plan to you know, give India back to the masses, to mm. reform the constitution, to create, you know, new laws, to, uh, you know, th this was also a period of uh, self-reliance, you know, when George Fernandez uh, kicked out IBM and Coca-Cola right. and, you know, built up indigenous, uh, you know, the IT sector in India, if it exists, it exists because IBM was kicked out by huh. George Fernandez for selling outdated uh, machinery at a high price. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, you know, it was a, a colonial, neo-colonial form of doing business. Right. Uh, and it, it was a period of great transformation, but it ended very soon. Hmm. And they never got a majority in the Rajya Sabha to make fundamental changes to the constitution or even reverse the constitution to the way it was before the, the emergency. emergency. What, what does it and, mean though? Uh, sorry, please finish. Uh, and it's just that yeah, after that, so after they fell in 1980, almost every major leader that we've come to associate with modern, you know, modern India in the last few decades has arisen from the Janta Party hmm. across a wide range of spectra. So even uh, you know, non-conventional choices. So, you know, uh, you have, uh, you know, these caste leaders in UP and Vihar. So, for example, uh, uh, Ram Vilas Paswan or Lalu Prasad Yadav, uh, they started off there. You even have Subramaniam Swami, who started off in the Janta Party. You have Arun Jaitley, who came from the Janta Party. So, it's a very wide mix, you know. Later on, they were, you know, shuffling between opposed to each other. Right, yeah. Yeah, and shopping between each other but uh, a lot of what we see today modern politics is defined by you know what was essentially the second independence movement of india hmm. in 1977 hmm. but i'm still like you know what the fascinating part is what you mentioned is that jay prakash is not a name it's a set of ideals hmm. what are those ideals what is that commitment to so the, uh, there's a famous speech you know when uh, atal bihari vajpayee left the Janta Party, when the Janta Party collapsed, in hmm. fact, and splintered into various uh, Factions. new parties. Right. Yes. In 1980, the BJP was born, and Atul Bihari Vajpayee gave a speech in which he said, Janta Party toot gai, hmm. lekin hum Jai Prakash ke sapno ko tootne nahi denge. Hmm. Jai Prakash kisi vyakti ka naam nahi, hmm. Jai Prakash kuch adarshon ka naam hai, hmm. kuch hmm. mulyo ka naam hai. And that, that was about rejecting you know, foreign ideologies mm. and their agents, and about creating you know, an indigenous narrative, giving self-respect to you know our citizens, not treating uh, citizens as subjects, you know, as mm. these savage natives who need to be civilized, who you know need this 
uh, carrot and stick state that uh, you know rewards them for good behavior and punishes them for bad behavior. But a state is made up of its citizens. The citizens have a right to demand and get a state that works for them. Hmm. A state which reflects their values. Hmm. It's not the responsibility of the people to live up to the uh, the values that you know a bunch of elites set up for them, but rather to have a fully decolonized state, hmm. a country you know that is actually by the people for the people of the people. Hmm. Right. I think I'll save what that looks like for another time. I think I, I at least have one hour worth more questions and I don't even mean that as an exaggeration. I have my mind going in all directions right now, but this has been fantastic. Did oh, you have likewise. fun? Oh, yes, so much. Thank you. And, huh. Go ahead. Yeah, and with, you know, the directions it takes, yeah, uh, I don't have any prescriptions myself either. It would be exciting to see, you know, how the people take it forward because at the end of the day, uh, if we are to be a true democracy, if we are to have, you know, a country whose state institutions, whose uh, values are reflections of the people, then it's completely in the hands of the people to take it in the direction they want hmm. and in the manner that they want to. Hmm. So it's going to be an exciting couple of decades ahead. Right. For sure. For sure. Thank you so much, Richard. This has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you.